Hi, I'm Dr. Gil Welch, and this is the third of four brief presentations that attempt to communicate the trade-offs involved in cancer screening. In this video, we'll consider the problem of overdiagnosis. First, let's just review what cancer screening is. It's the systematic search for cancer in people who have no symptoms or signs of cancer. The benefit of cancer screening? Well, the primary benefit is a reduction in cancer-specific mortality. The language we should use is screening reduces the cancer death rate. Cancer screening harms fall into two categories, false positive results, which we talked about on the previous video, and overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis is the detection of a cancer that is not destined to ever cause symptoms or death. You might remember it as cancers that don't matter. Now that may be a pretty foreign or new idea for you. And understanding overdiagnosis requires thinking about the word cancer differently. I suggest you give yourself more than 10 minutes to really learn about it. When I was in medical school, I was taught that a cancerous cell would progress to cause in situ cancer, which would progress to cause invasive cancer, which would progress to metastatic cancer, which would ultimately lead to death. It was a stepwise process that was invariably going forward. We now realize the world's a more complicated place. A cancerous cell can progress to in situ cancer or it can stop. In situ cancer can progress to invasive cancer or it can stop. Invasive cancer may progress to metastatic cancer or it may stop. And metastatic cancer may lead to cancer death, or it may not. That leads us to a new conception of cancer. You might think of three types of cancer. The birds, the rabbits, and the turtles. The goal of early detection is to sort of fence these in. But you can't fence a bird in. It can fly away. Those are the worst form, the most rapidly growing forms of cancer. The rabbits you may catch if you build enough fences. Those would be the cancers that might benefit from screening. But the third type of cancer is the turtle, and they're not going anywhere anyway. You don't need a fence there. That leads to an uncomfortable reality. The pathologic diagnosis of cancer encompasses a wide variety of abnormalities. The familiar, what I learned in medical school, were cellular abnormalities which, if left untreated, progress to cause death. The unfamiliar, cellular abnormalities that do not progress and may even regress. Those are the turtles. Let me share with you an article from Life magazine by Dr. George Kreil. It's entitled, A Plea Against the Blind Fear of Cancer, and I'll just quote a paragraph here. In clinical practice, to say that a person has cancer gives us little information about the possible course of his disease as to say he has an infection. There are dangerous infections that may be fatal, and there are harmless infections that are self-limited or may disappear. The same is true of cancers. Cancer is not a single entity. It is a broad spectrum of diseases related to each other only in name. This article appeared in the year I was born, 1955. A rude reminder that I've never had an original idea in my life. It's an uncomfortable reality. There are a lot of turtles out there. At least a third of adults harbor small thyroid cancers. About a third of women aged 40 to 49 harbor small breast cancers. Over half of men over age 60 harbor small prostate cancers. In the past, doctors treated a population and they waited for problems to develop and then they diagnosed and treated the cancer. The early diagnosis ideal was to take that same population and through early diagnosis find those patients earlier in time with the hope that the natural history of those individuals were those who were destined to develop problems. But the current reality is quite different. Early diagnosis always seems to identify more patients. 
So now the natural history must be more complex. Hopefully we've identified those who are destined to develop problems, but we've also diagnosed those not destined to develop problems, the turtles. They are the overdiagnosed and needlessly treated fraction. This is the black hole. Now I'm not a physicist, but I gather physicists never directly observe black holes. Instead, they infer their existence by what's going on around them. Maybe light is being bent by gravitational forces. It's not a bad analogy for overdiagnosis. We never directly observe overdiagnosis. Instead, we infer its existence by what's going on around it. Here's the game plan. In this video, we'll consider where overdiagnosis is most obvious prostate cancer, which is the poster child for the problem. And we'll also consider thyroid cancer, melanoma, and kidney cancer. This is where you can see the problem of overdiagnosis from space. And in the next video, we'll consider where overdiagnosis is most carefully measured from a long-term follow-up of a randomized trial of screening. And we have examples of that both in lung cancer and breast cancer. As I said, overdiagnosis is most widely understood in prostate cancer screening. How many normal men have prostate cancer? Here's an intriguing study of the prostate cancer reservoir and 525 men dying from an accidental death. These are men not known to have cancer during life. The authors stratified their results based on the age group. And they found in the 20 to 29 year age group, even 10% of young men were, had evidence of prostate cancer at autopsy. In the 30 to 39 year age group, 30% of men had pathologic evidence of prostate cancer. 40 to 59, around 40% of men had pathologic evidence of prostate cancer. 60 to 69, 70% of men had pathologic evidence of prostate cancer, and 70 to 79, 80% of men had pathologic evidence of prostate cancer. Now we're screening men in between ages 40 and 80, and if you wanted to remember one number, I suggest thinking about 50% of men in this age group have some evidence of prostate cancer. How deep is the reservoir in prostate cancer? Well, it depends what you mean. Only 3% of American males are destined to die from prostate cancer. But 17% are destined to be diagnosed with prostate cancer, and over 50% have prostate cancer. Now you see the problem. How hard should we look for prostate cancer? An unnecessary cancer diagnosis is an obvious harm. Simply being told one has cancer has some negative consequences. But overdiagnosed cancers are typically treated, and this is the biggest harm of overdiagnosis. It's treatment that cannot help because there's nothing to fix. Patient is never destined to suffer from symptoms of their cancer. It's treatment that can only lead to harm, and all of our treatments have some harm. I said at the outset that cancer screening is up against staggering odds. Here we have a thousand squares meant to represent a thousand men who were screened over a decade. Now, not all of them are destined to die from prostate cancer. In fact, very few are, even in an older population, somewhere around 10 to 12. Which leads to the fundamental reality of screening. Screening must involve many to potentially benefit a few. This is in distinct contrast to treatment, where treatment potentially benefits all because everybody has the problem. And of course, we can't help all those destined to die. Screening would be lucky if it could help about a quarter, maybe three, avoid a cancer death. The rest are not helped. In fact, most are not helped which is why it's relevant to ask what happens to the other 997, 998 in the process. 
The problem of overdiagnosis is disturbingly common in prostate cancer screening. Screening a thousand men over a decade, somewhere between 30 and 100 will be overdiagnosed. I'm showing you 50 here. Roughly half of those will suffer a serious side effect from treatment, generally related to their urinary or sexual function. For me, that's enough information. It doesn't look like screening's a good deal. I don't want it. That's without considering the other problem, all the false alarms, roughly 300 out of a thousand men will suffer from that. So the problem of overdiagnosis is most widely understood in prostate cancer screening, but it's increasingly recognized as a problem associated with the early detection of other cancers, cancers like melanoma, kidney cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, and thyroid cancer. Here's what's happening in thyroid cancer. These are data from the SEER program, which is the U.S.'s major effort to track cancer incidence and mortality. Over the period 1975 to 2010, we saw a dramatic increase in the rate of thyroid cancer detection. It was pretty flat till the mid-1990s, and then it increased threefold. Now, if this was an epidemic of genuine disease, what would I expect to see happen to the death rate? Well, I'd expect it to go up. Or maybe I'd expect it to go up and then down a bit after there was some new test or treatment. But in fact, what do we see? We see the most stable mortality rate in the SEER data. That doesn't look like an epidemic of disease. It looks like an epidemic of diagnosis. There's a lot of people there. That area under the curve, most of that represents overdiagnosis. People who have had their thyroid removed and now need lifelong thyroid replacement. And it's not just thyroid cancer. Melanoma has increased about threefold over the period. Again, the death rate is roughly stable. Again, a lot of overdiagnosis. Kidney cancer, or more formally, renal cell carcinoma. Its rate has doubled over this period. Its mortality rate is stable. Again, a lot of overdiagnosis a lot of people receiving nephrectomy for a cancer that was never going to bother them. Here's what you should know. One, overdiagnosis is the detection of a cancer that is not destined to ever cause symptoms or death. It's a side effect of screening. Second, because doctors cannot reliably distinguish which cancers will matter and which will not, overdiagnosed cancers are typically treated treatment that cannot help and can only hurt. And finally, while prostate cancer is the poster child for the problem, some degree of overdiagnosis in early cancer detection is less the exception and more the rule. I hope this helps. Thanks.